Yes, thank you. So I'm going to talk about shellfish resiliency, some of the projects that the district has been doing with many, many partners to help make sure that um, our shellfish industry, uh, by which I'm mainly speaking about softshell clams, this is our fourth most important fishery in the state of Maine, after lobster, what, elvers, maybe alewives, shellfish are four. And it's, it, it changes somewhat, you know, with the season and, and um, with uh, changes in the market and all that kind of stuff. But shellfish have been, been the fourth most important fishery for a while in Maine. And um, like other fisheries, it's having some challenges, as we were just talking. Um, climate change is stressing everything. And um, increasingly, we're finding that in order to maintain productive fisheries and productive coastal communities, uh, productive um, coastal economies, we increasingly have to kind of step in and, and manipulate things. Um, uh, it's getting harder and harder to make a living on a wild fishery because all the wild fisheries are in trouble. Increasingly, we have to do things to help them out. And that's that's the idea behind the talk tonight. So I'm Mark Whiting. I'm chair of the board for the Hancock County Saltwater Conservation District. We serve all of the county, um, all of the towns, including the unorganized territories. We provide uh, services to the unorganized territories. For instance, we provide um, invasive plant patrols and courtesy boat inspections on the Bureau of Public Lands lakes that don't have lake associations. So most of these services are provided by lake associations in the rest of Maine. Um, the BPL lakes, Tunk, Donnell, Spring River, Long Pond, Nicotoas. Um, they do have some private development, but mostly they're, they're in the BPL lands and they'll never have large, productive, active lake associations. So other people have to do that, and that's one of the th that's become our niche, I think. Uh, we also work with lake associations. We do a lot of water quality work. Um, we facilitate other people who are doing water quality work. We have two DO meters that we lend out. Um, one of them is not active at the moment, so if you're doing uh, work on Taunton Bay and need an oxygen meter, you can come and see us. We lend it out for free. Um, most of our work with lake associations is on camp roads, maintaining and stabilizing camp roads, people's driveways, eroding shoreline, that sort of thing. Um, I mentioned maybe before you came in that I do some red tide monitoring for DMR to make sure that the shellfish, once they're harvested, are safe and can go to market and be safely consumed. That's a volunteer effort, another, another one of the citizen science projects that we do. Uh, a third citizen science project that we do is we're collecting water quality from trout streams in Hancock County. We've discovered, uh, well, my old job, when I was working for DEP back when I was employed, had to work for a living, um, I was working with Downey Salmon Federation on salmon restoration in eastern Maine, especially in Washington County. And what we, what we discovered was is that uh, one of the things that's holding back salmon recovery is that these systems have been pushed uh, up beyond the breaking point for certain fish species, especially Atlantic salmon. So they've passed survival thresholds for pH, calcium, alkalinity, aluminum, um, and those kinds of things. And it isn't widely appreciated. So I've tried to communicate this, but I, I just can't generate a consensus. And so I'm doing another Lyman project just to prove it to the bastards. And um, um, what we're finding doing water quality research in Hancock County is we're seeing exactly the same issues. We don't have any salmon, but we do have really vulnerable um, heritage brook trout populations. And even though the brook trout are the most acid resistant, the most acid tolerant, and the Atlantic salmon are the least, we feel that in both Hancock and Washington County, these systems are being pushed to the breaking point 
or even brook trout are probably having trouble. So that's another thing I'm working on and trying to get people's attention. And um, what else do we do? Oh, <clears throat> so we do some free soil testing for gardeners and for farmers. So if you're in either one of those categories, you can come to our office and leave bags of soil off. We'll test, we only do pH, because that's all we're set up for. <laughs> but pH is a good beginning because it tells, pH, if you have the wrong pH, then it ties up nutrients in the soil and then you don't get trace minerals and sometimes you don't even get phosphorus and other critical nutrients. And so we do that for free. If you need to know more, you'll have to go to Cooperative Extension and they, they, they you're, you have to pay for that. So there's a range of different tests. The minimum test, I think, is like 16 bucks. And if you get the Cadillac version, it's 35 bucks. So you get a lot for not much money. And it's really, if you're a farmer in particular, it's a really good service to use. Oh, and then one of the things that we do is shellfish resiliency. <laughs> so getting back on topic, so this talk tonight is going to have two aspects. We kind of started out on ocean acidification because working on salmon, that was my thing. And um, ocean acidification is a little bit different than freshwater acidification. You're, you're talking about different pollutants. With acid rain and freshwater, you're talking about nitric and sulfuric acid that's coming out of smoke stacks. And um, it mixes with the rain and it forms um, strong mineral acids that impact the soil and make our soils, which are already extremely acidic, even more so, tie up nutrients. It's a problem for the forest, and it's, but it's a problem for the fish as well. And so um, ocean acidification is a little different. It, the, the pollutant comes out of the same smokestacks, but it's carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide, when you mix it with the water in the atmosphere, forms carbonic acid. It's kind of a weak acid, but it's, it still causes loads of trouble. And there's been so much of it that it's actually changing the pH of the ocean. So if you're not chemists, this is actually kind of interesting, really kind of out there, because freshwater tends to be really poorly buffered and really dilute, especially in Maine. Maybe not so much in Colorado or Wyoming, but we have really, really soft water here. It's like rainwater with some tea bags dipped in it and um, very low alkalinity, very low conductivity, not a lot of nutrients, not very well buffered. Uh, but the, the, the ocean is completely the opposite. So everything that erodes from the land ends up in the ocean. And so all the carbonate calcium carbonate that we've lost in our salmon rivers is now out there. And that's been happening for four and a half million, billion years. And so oceans are basically saturated with calcium carbonate. So here's, here's our fresh waters really well dilute. And here's our ocean basically saturated with buffering material, calcium carbonate. Even the ocean is being changed by these pollutants that are coming out of these smokestacks. Yes? Sorry to interrupt, but I don't know what buffering means. So buffering, yeah, so that's, that's a good question. So I'm glad you asked. So buffers are chemicals that um, act as a, as a buffer. They take some kind of bad result and they make it less bad. They buffer it. They, ameliorate it. And uh, calcium carbonate does that because it's a, it's a weak acid and a weak base. And so if you add acids, the acids are consumed, and, uh, um, but, and the pH changes a little bit, but not very much. So it's been buffered. And if you add alkalinity, um, that pushes the system a little bit the other way. Uh, but uh, because it's a weak acid, it can also absorb alkaline materials. It, it all, it, so it, it can act as, a, as an acid, but it can also act as a base. Uh -huh. 
And so it, it buffers any kind of problems that come from either direction, in essence. Um, and calcium carbonate is the chief buffer in freshwater. And it's, it's even the main buffer um, in saltwater. Uh, so there's some, there's some borate and there's some silica and there's some other things that, that buffer oceans. And they're important. But still, the primary buffer is calcium carbonate. And smokestacks are changing even that. And that should be mind-blowing. So oceans, oh, I'll get to that. I'll get to that in a minute. Let, let me do this first. So we started out with ocean acidification because that was my thing. And um, everybody's talking about it. And it was entirely possible at the time that that was what was kind of driving our shellfish to the point where we were having reproductive failures on mud flats. Flats that had been historically very productive were becoming unproductive. Flats that had been fished for years and years were suddenly barren. And people didn't know what was going on. So some of it is overfishing. And um, Frenchman's Bay Regional Shellfish Commission Committee has done a lot in that respect. So seven towns got together and they're sharing permits. So one permit is good in all seven towns. Uh, the, the, Frenchman, the Frenchman's Bay resource, resource is managed collectively. Um, and so a lot of really good things started happening. And um, so we were thinking, well, management is getting better. Maybe this is a pollution problem. We started looking at acid rain. We got a little bit of money from Eastern Maine Conservation Initiative, which is a local group serving down East Maine, if you know them. If you write grants, if you, if you have an NGO, they are just great. And so we got a little bit of money. We bought some equipment. We got together with some friends, and we developed this network for the Down East area that was doing ocean acidification monitoring. A lot of this was, was research, but some of it was educational. So there in Castine, Maine Maritime Academy was one of our partners. Oh, that's my cue. We have lots of partners. <laughs> okay, Maine Maritime, I think, is that one in the lower left. And UM, you know UM, University of Maine at Machias. And University of Maine, College of the Atlantic, MDI Biological Lab, if you've been down on the island, you know them. Uh, Maine Conservation Corps, that's, um, that's us. That's Maine Department of Ag. That's who I volunteer for. Um, island Heritage Trust, they're down on Deer Isle. Uh, down East Institute, that's Brian Beal out on Great Wasp Island. They're, they're our um, clam hatchery. They, they grow the little baby clams that we buy and put out on the mud flats. Uh, this one here is the Marine Environmental Research Institute. That's actually the old name in Blue Hill. It's now called the Shaw Institute. So if you know your way around Blue Hill, that's them. Frenchman's Bay Partners. You guys are a Frenchman's Bay Partner, right? Yeah. And the friends, and of all things, the Friends of Casco Bay. So wouldn't you know, they beat us to the punch. They started doing this before we did. I was so embarrassed. And um, so they worked out all of the kind of bugs and equipment and protocols and that kind of stuff. And so that's why they're one of our partners. We just kind of adopted their protocols. And it made a really nice group of people to work with. And um, this was just 2016 when we started. Since then, we've added uh, Unity College. And, um, and of all things, the Bucksport Middle School. We took the seventh grade out to Sandy Point. We put out our Beal boxes, which you'll see, and they did the whole thing. It was just so cool. The kids just had a blast. There were like 10 buses of kids going out to Sandy Point. And the kids just loved it, and they did a great job. Oh, so how do you measure pH? So I used a pH probe, and we were interested in um, whether there are differences in different tidal levels. So we looked at the upper intertidal, middle, middle intertidal, and the lower intertidal, all of which grow clams very well. Um, 
I also, being a scientist, I wanted to take several measurements so that I could average them. And so I take three measurements in, at the surface, just you know, underneath the surface, and three more measurements about, a, about an inch down, which is about as far as my probe could go. I couldn't, find, couldn't afford anything fancier. <laughs> so I could only go down an inch. And so we, we did basically the surface and about an inch down. And um, the critters that we were interested in are the soft shell clam, um, because that's primarily what the Frenchman's Bay Regional Shellfish uh, Committee is harvesting. And they have a very interesting life cycle. Most of the life cycle is planktonic. Like a lot of marine organisms, they just cast their eggs and sperm out in the water. The fertilization takes place. These little planktonic larvae swim around. And they get up to a certain point, and they become like little bitty clams. And they just stop swimming, and they settle out. So this, this metamorphosis is where they come, where they transform themselves from plankton into um, clam spat. So the, the spat are the juveniles, and that's what we're looking at because we feel they're the ones that really have the hardest time in these trying times, whether it's chemical or predation. Um, they're the ones that are, you know, taking it on the chin. So that's what we were looking at. <clears throat> There are some other commercial um, fisheries, clams or bivalves. Um, one of those is the quahog, or if you're local, quahog. <laughs> so, so I call it quahog because I grew up in Maryland and that's, that's what we say down south. So up here you would probably say quahog. It's a commercial variety. It's a large, very heavy clam, very hard shell much more resistant to predators than the soft shell clam. Um, some people also fish for the surf clams, the spicula. Um, that, that's a fairly minor fishery. Most of what we're concerned about are these, the steamer clams, soft shell clams. This is what most people eat and has the greatest market value. Um, oysters, on the other hand, are something new, and increasingly they're escaping from aquaculture and they're living more and more out, just wild, out there. And you're going to see this if, you, if you're out on mud flats or, t or tidal flats anywhere, you're going to see more and more oysters growing wild. And uh, blue mussels, of course. So next week, Fiona DeCanning and Alex are going to be here. They're mussel growers. But they're going to be talking about scallops. So I didn't have scallops in, in, in here, but scallops are another bivalve, bivalve that are a really important fishery in Maine. So <clears throat> we started doing this in 2016 and um, kind of ended up in 2019, kind of ran out of steam, changed our focus a little bit. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, by 2019, we were looking at all of these different sites with all of these different partners and all of these different towns. For, we had four years of data on some of these. And so it was a really good baseline. So 10 years from now, we can go back and see. Um, so we kind of decided that maybe pH wasn't it. <laughs> and we kind of morphed our project into something else. But we felt, thought, felt like pH is still going to be an issue. Acidity pH is still going to be an issue. And it may become more important as time goes by, so we want to keep an eye on it. So we have this wonderful baseline data. So I should mention that pH is a, is a measure of acidity. Um, <clears throat> pH 7 is right there in the middle of the scale. And pH 7 is neutral. So anything with a larger number is alkaline. And, and, and that includes the ocean. So the pH of the ocean is about 8.2 or, or maybe even 8.3 if you're lucky. Um, and then fresh waters, in Maine in particular, tend to be acidic. So anything below pH 7 is acidic. 6 is a little bit. 
five is actually pretty darn acidic. And a lot of our fresh waters around here are between um, six and seven sometimes. Some of them are between five and six. And it's those streams between five and six where we're having trouble with all kinds of fish species. Okay, so the pH of the ocean should be 8.2 or 8.3 or so. Got that? So, uh, we looked at pH in the sediment, and not surprisingly, um, so this is pH 7, kind of in the middle, and most of, half of what we found was alkaline, and some of it was getting up to a pH 8, which is what you would expect of the ocean. Um, <clears throat> but there was very little that was the same pH as the ocean, and that's due to carbon dioxide in the mud. So the thing about mud is that um, water moves through it, but not very quickly. And so the water in mud tends to be kind of stagnant, and uh, there's a lot of bacteria in there, and a lot of organic matter because our estuaries are pretty rich. And so what happens is that the bacteria are eating up all this organic matter, they're using up oxygen and giving off carbon dioxide. And you remember from our earlier discussion that carbon dioxide in water creates carbonic acid, which is a weak acid, and that's what's driving pH down. And notice it can go way down, way, way, way down. So half of our measurements from here over, that's acidic, and some of it is really very acidic. You notice some pHs are in the fives. So that would be bad for fresh water. I mean, you know, that would be problematic for some freshwater organisms. So I thought, well, this has to be a problem. <laughs> but I was soon to find out otherwise. So anyway, this is what our data looked, looked like for the different intertidal depths. So the top of the bar and the bottom of the bar represent the high value and the low value. And the average, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a bar across the middle sometimes, or even at the bottom, that's the average. And, um, and in this case, we see that as you went, as you started from the shore and walk out, the most acidic sites were high and the most alkaline, the most oceanic sites were further out. Well, that makes sense, right? So you, here's the shore, you have fresh water coming in, rain, some groundwater. So you have carbon dioxide, but you also have some dilution of the salt water. And so, so the pH is relatively low, very acidic, probably due to a fresh water input. So that was kind of totally what I expected. But guess what? It doesn't always do that. <laughs> so it's just as often that there's no pattern at all or that the pattern goes the other way. So it's alkaline in the high intertidal zone and maybe most acidic out in the ocean. And that has to be carbon dioxide. But it was just, just the opposite of what I would have expected. So it's kind of crazy. You know, it was, um, I learned a lot. <laughs> um, Yes. Oh, sorry. Upper, lower. Yeah, so this is upper intertidal. That's lower intertidal. So this is one of those where the acidic ones were furthest out. So this is one of the surprise ones. Yeah. Yeah. You read this correctly. <laughs> you must be a teacher. I'm dyslexic, so I reverse everything in my head. So, yeah, this is the upper inner tidal, that's the lower inner tidal. So, um, we had been doing this for four years, and then we started working more with Brian Beal. And Brian did some experiments like we did. And, um, well, even, even our experiments, you know, we found these really apparently problematic sites 
where pH is just very, very low, very acidic, and you would think very problematic for a marine organism that should be living in pH 8 water. What's it like living in pH 5.6 water? Well, clams were doing well there. <laughs> so the, those weren't necessarily the dead muds. And Brian Beal, professor at UMM, U -M -M, uh, and owner and uh, um, um, the uh, scientific, the brains behind the Down East Institute, um, he was able to convince us that it was really the predators that were determining where we were getting good clam spat um, and good clam recruitment. And so we changed gears a bit and we started looking at recruitment and uh, with the idea that it's probably more the, the predators, especially the blue cra or the green crabs, uh, more than anything else. So remember when we were talking about the life cycle of the clam, how they settle out of the plankton and it's just a little bitty thing that's sitting on top of the mud. Well, that's where the crabs are. So they, the crabs go along the surface, eating up all these little baby clams and anything else that they can get. And they'll even dig down and get the larger clams. But the, the bigger they are, the bigger the clam, the deeper they are, and the more effort it is to get down there and get them. And so it's not, just not very efficient. So this crab could eat a, a full-size clam, and they just kind of start at the edge and they break the shell back till they can reach in it and get at the meat. But they generally don't because it's just too much work. So they mainly eat the smaller clams. And so the idea was, Brian's idea was, well, let's get the clam started in a protected environment. And so he, he invented this spat box. It's also called the Beal box for some reason. <laughs> and it's, um, it's basically a wooden box. So there's wooden strapping, just pine one by three or whatever it is, pine strapping, um, attached on the corners. So it's about two and a half inches deep with um, window screen on the top and the bottom. We actually use pet screen because very heavy duty. And then, then we use lath to kind of nail it down because the screen is just stapled on. And so if you tried to pick that up, these get filled with mud. And so it weighs, I don't know, 20 pounds or something when, when there's mud in it. So it, it, would, it could just rip the staples out and you would lose everything. So we nail the lath on to reinforce it. So we, we build these and we put them out empty. I, I found that surprising. <laughs> but it's actually very smart because it keeps the crabs out. So you, you kind of settle these down in the mud you put a couple of stakes on either side to anchor it. And the tide and the waves come back and forth, back and forth. And it fills it or half fills it with mud. And the mud, in order to get there, has to filter through the screen. And that's what keeps the crabs out. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, and, and, and the crab, or the uh, clam spat, remember it's planktonic, was really, really, really small. Even by the time it's settling out of the water column, it's still, uh, still under a millimeter long. It's barely visible. So it goes right through the screen. So the baby crabs go through the screen too, because they're also planktonic. But they're the same size as the baby clams. And a predator has to be bigger than its food, and it doesn't work for the, the crabs. So the clams grow up in a largely predator-free environment. Oh, I should mention that the screen on the bottom keeps the ribbon worms out. Do you know ribbon worms? Milky, milky ribbon worms? Somebody, nobody? Yeah, so it's a flat worm. No, it's not one of the uh, commercial worms. So the commercial worms are polychaetes. They're, they look like a landworm, but they have, um, they have appendages. They have uh, what kind of feathery limbs, and they um, and they dig. They um, 
And they swim. They can use their appendages to swim. Kind of a breaststroke, really. Yeah. Um, and they're quite big. They can be quite long. And they can be, what is that, a centimeter wide? Maybe more. So they're, they're fairly big. And the screen on the bottom just keeps them out. So as I, as I say, it allows the baby clams to grow up in a protected environment. From, from, and usually, we put out the spat boxes empty. So we could buy clams and put them in there. But in these protected environments, you can often get natural sets. And if you can get your baby clams, your spat for free, why wouldn't you? <laughs> Um, so one of the problem with the spat boxes is that they're really small and we wanted to do this on a really grand scale. And so the Frenchman's Bay Regional Shellfish Group invented their super spat box. And there's no wood in it because you have to pick it up. And so the lighter the better. So this really has a pet screen on the bottom and it has an aquaculture screen on the top. And the, the mesh, is, mesh is pretty small. Uh, it's a few centimeters. I don't know, five centimeters? Centimeters? No. Five millimeters or so. So it's, it's about a quarter of an inch, something like that. So it keeps the bigger cram, crabs out. Excuse me, that, that's the pet screen you're talking about? So the pet screen's on the bottom, but the aquaculture screen is on the top and it's a quarter inch mesh. And um, so we want, the problem with putting two pet screens together is that they could just sit t flat and could squash, the, we want the little critters in there to get down in the mud and grow. So we want this to fill with sand again and we want the little critters to live in mud and be able to dig. And so the, the aquaculture screen helps us do that. We actually kind of stake these out and then um, we, we tuck the, the edges of the netting in by digging a trench and then mounting the dirt up. And we just keep mounting the dirt up on top of the net so that it fills with mud and so it's a, a good environment for the baby clams. <laughs> yeah, um, so we put out some flagging and um, the guys that work out there know, know their way around pretty well. <laughs> I swear they could con lose a contact lens and go back out later and find it. They really do know their way around. Um, there's, you know, um, if you're really familiar with a place, there are rocks and there are um, Actually, this is, in Mar this is at Marlboro Beach, and there's an old shipwreck out there. That's one of our landmarks that we use, is the old shipwreck, this wooden bottom of the boat. Uh, oh, so, and, and so this is like um, five feet wide and something like 15 feet long. And so instead of just two feet by one feet, it's um, way bigger and um, we usually buy spat. We, we would put maybe 10,000 maybe clams in a net this size. And that's, that's pretty thin. But of course they grow much larger. So um, that'll hold about 10,000 clams. So we let them grow out during the summer and in the fall we harvest them because the nets would just be destroyed by winter ice. So we, we can't leave them out there. So we have to harvest our clams and take them somewhere. And so we, oh yeah, sorry, that's a different slide. We'll get to that, what happens over winter. Um, so in the spat boxes, these are different spat boxes and these are the um, surviving spat from natural sets. So these, there was no hatchery clams here. So these were just closed boxes. The only clams in there went in there naturally. 
and we got a bunch of free clams. So there were four to 500, um, even 550 clams sometimes in these boxes. And they would grow out in a season to be, if you're lucky, maybe about a half an inch. And um, it didn't, wasn't always this good. Sometimes you would have nothing. There'd be one very big, happy blue, uh, green crab and nothing else. Or sometimes you would have 2,000 clams in there. But I was never that lucky. This was the best I could do. <laughs> um, and then <clears throat> um, this is looking at um, the size distribution of them. So they went out very small as seed clams, less than a quarter of an inch. And they ended up being kind of a half an inch or um, 25 millimeters, I think, is an inch. So the you know, very, very upper level is up to an inch. And that's, that's a fair size clam. That's halfway to being a legal clam. So you can harvest them at two inches, measured the long way. So that's, that's pretty good growth in a season. So we expect baby clams to grow up and be harvestable size in two to three years. So not bad for a free clam. Um, we also looked at the growth of our hatchery clams in the big nets. And um, so I'm only looking at the new growth. So we got them from the hatchery. And so there is this small, hard, very smooth shell. And that's called the hatchery mark at the umbo. I don't have a shell here, but the umbo is the, the corner, the, the peak of the clam. And then they, they grow out like tree rings. I mean, you can actually see rings of the growth. So they put on growth fast during the summer. They don't grow at all during the winter. And so you, you get a year's growth showing as a ring. And you can, it's dependable enough that you can usually age them that way. Well, these were hatchery clams. So they came to us already with a few months of growth from the hatchery. And they were small, just a few millimeters. And some of them put on very little growth for whatever reason. I don't know why. But most of them put on quite a bit of growth. They more than doubled their size. And some of them were actually huge. They, um, again, we're kind of, so if you start off with something that's a quarter of an inch and you get another, um, what, quarter of an inch, I mean, you end up with a fairly good sized clam, either way, with a hatchery clam or the natural set. Uh, we like the hatchery clams because it's dependable. And um, with the really big nets, you can do this at basically a commercial scale, I think. So what do you do with the clams when you need to overwinter them? So we harvest them. We scoop them up out of the nets. We sieve them with a, a hose, washing everything through a pet screen. We collect the clams, which are now quite a bit bigger, and we put them in these oyster cages. So this is how you would grow out oysters. Clams will not grow this way. Clams have to be down in the dirt in order to grow. But they don't grow in the winter anyway. <laughs> and so the oyster bags are a perfectly good way to keep them over winter. It keeps the crabs out. And we just kind of hang them in Brian Beal's lobster pound on Beal's Island. And then in the next spring, we, instead of a little bitty seed clam, now we've got a, a really big seed clam. And now we're, instead of putting them in a net, we're seeding them directly in the sediment. And we did, did that this spring for the first time. And then we just put the aquaculture net over the top. So the critters are actually down in the mud, which is where they need to be. They can go as deep as they want. And they're going to do that as they get bigger through the season. They should be at least an inch by the end of this year. And, um, and so we just have the top net to keep the biggest crabs out. And hopefully some gulls and other varmints. 
So what's the outcome? Well, we don't know yet because <laughs> we just put them out this spring. Um, so we started with 100,000 clams and we harvested 60,000 at the end of the season. So most of them survived in the big nets. Um, we overwintered them. Not all of them made it. They didn't like being crushed together at the, in the bottom of the oyster bags. Maybe there's a way we can work on that. But we seeded a whole bunch of them out. We didn't count them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, tens of thousands of them. So I, I bet we seeded out 50,000 clams this spring. And so we have them under five big nets. And hopefully we get harvestable clams in two years. And that's kind of the idea. It would be nice if Mother Nature would do all the work, but we're increasingly concerned that Mother Nature needs some help. And that's what we're trying to do. So, any questions? Where, where are the five big nets? So, these five big nets this year are in Marlboro Beach. So, we had some uh, that we put out in uh, the skillings. And um, <clears throat> for some reason, those big nets, the, the net on the top, the aquaculture net, is actually very fine. It's very fragile. And they were just torn up. And I don't know what happened. Um, so is that boats going over them? Is that people stepping on them? Is that really big clams working their way in there? I don't know. But the, the, the nets were a total loss. That did not happen at Marlboro Beach, for whatever reason. <laughs> so all of our survivors were from Marlboro Beach, and you, you're not supposed to take clams from one place and put them in another. That's a whole different permit, and we didn't go that way. <laughs> so they all went back into Marlboro Beach. So if you got there in Lemoyne, next time you're in Lemoyne, go to Marlboro Beach, and you'll see those it's kind of like those big nets, but there's no bottom, no pet screen on the bottom. It's just the aquaculture net on top. To keep the crabs out. Is the water different with Marlboro? I, we got some clams, and we gave us some clams and some uh, mussels. It, it was so beautiful, just packed full of meat. I'd never seen anything like that, except in the San Paul's River, the Tidal River pot. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, across from south of South Carolina, Elliot, I guess. I dug clams in there. And yeah. I <clears throat> big, beautiful black clams with like yellow fat sticking out around the edge. Yeah. And it was four, like four miles downstream with a sewage treatment plant. Those are such big clams. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think Frenchman's Bay yeah. and uh, Taunton Bay and, and, um, some other bays have really good water quality and tend to be very clear. Um, the Skillings I thought was really muddy. I think Upper Hog Bay tends to be rather muddy. Um, the clams, doesn't bother the clams any because they, they eat everything, um, sediment and all. In fact, the sediment has a lot of bacteria on it and they might even help them feed. Gives them roughage, keeps them regular whatever. The clams don't, don't seem to mind. Um, other organisms uh, are bothered by turbidity. Fish in particular tend to be visual feeders and um, tend to struggle in muddy water. But uh, we have a lot of really nice clean clear estuaries here so I think we're particularly fortunate. So the project comes to a conclusion this fall? The correct? first phase, yeah, well, we'll see how successful it is this fall. And if it, if it is successful, we'll keep doing it. And um, if other people want to do it, so we have a lot of um, spat boxes. Um, the spat boxes are really good for educational purposes and for scientific research. Spat boxes are really good for finding those sweet spots where you may, may be able to get a lot of free clams, a lot of... Um, natural clam set, uh, so maybe you wouldn't have to purchase spat. Um, 
And so the spat boxes may be very attractive for you because you may have, um, you know, the Sullivan um, School. May, well, actually, the Sullivan School is involved in this because I know they do this with um, the Scudic Institute. And, um, gee, what is the guy's name? Bill, Bill, Bill Z Zolik. Z Zalek or Zolik? Yeah. Wonderful people and um, wonderful program. Goes right into the schools. Um, I was getting kind of discouraged about getting local schools involved. And I just walked in. Well, actually, they came to me. Uh, the Bucksport Middle School found me and they came to me. And since then, um, the Belfast High School has come and we'll do something with them next year once the whole COVID thing so is over. What do you think this research is going to lead to? And then what, what, what's the end game here? So the end game is I think we can maintain productive mud flats even if we lose more of our natural sets. We may end up being more and more reliant on hatcheries. I hope it doesn't come to that. But um, for the big nets, the hatcheries were the easiest way to go so far. It would be nice to have the big nets and catch all natural spat. Um, so we paid something like $3,000 for our clams for the two different sites. Ten of these big nets. Um, so that was a reasonable cost for us. But clamors, you know, I think they live, live fairly close to the margin and unless they have state help or something, they may not be able to afford that. And so if they could, we're still trying to figure out how to catch that natural spat, those natural sets, and have it work at a commercial scale using natural set. Oh, the other thing that's happening that's going on is that the Frenchman's Bay Regional Shellfish Committee uh, passed a law to protect the, um, the clams that are over three inches. So you can, har ordinarily you can harvest anything over two inches. But the ones that command the best price are the ones, are the smaller ones. Once they get up to three inches, they're not as tender and only the tourists want those. <laughs> and so the, the little ones command a better price. And so the Frenchman's Bay Regional Shellfish Group said, well, from now on, as an experiment, we're not going to touch the ones that are over three inches. So this is like the lobster law. Yeah. So, yeah, so you protect those older females from predation and from from human predation. So you don't, you throw those back and they're the big ones. They're the ones that produce enormous amounts of eggs. They're probably really important in producing that natural spat. And so we were, we were thinking maybe to get the most out of mother nature, we could do something like that. So we'll see how that works too. You didn't, uh, you didn't really uh, say much about how you're working in the pH studies with your research. Uh, and uh, for instance, um, the really big ones that are down a foot, I guess you said, um, are they at a different pH? Of, uh, they would be, uh, and it would probably be pretty low, but I don't have the equipment to measure it. So I'd have to dig down and not disturb things. I, and, uh, yeah, it might be, it might be doable, and, and but I don't know. And presumably the mud in, in, um, in one place is similar to a mud in another place, but I, maybe that's wrong. You know, so we yeah. find, if we will find muds are, that are very patchy. Even at Marlboro Beach, you know, there are areas that are rocky. Um, there are areas that are sandy and firm that you can walk on top of. There are areas that are muddy and you'll sink you go over your ankles. There are places you'll go over your knee. There are places where you'll go up to your hip. <laughs> um, and all within a very small area. Um, fortunately, Marlboro Beach is one of the places where 
muds tend to be firm and relatively easy to get around in. Um, the Skillings was my least favorite site. It was very muddy, very difficult to walk around in. It's one of those places where you sink into your hip and you think you're going to be there forever. Yeah. <laughs> well, the mud in Fontaine Bay is actually pretty, pretty soft and you sink in. Yeah, and Hog Bay. Foot. Yeah, so I go into my knees in Hog Bay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so I should have had that slide. I, sh I should add that to this presentation. So the more recent work had some different sites that weren't there earlier. And um, there are two sites in Taunton Bay. So there's Hog Bay. And um, we also came in from uh, Settler's Landing. That's Taunton Bay, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought. Just over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Yeah, we were right over there. <laughs> um, so we'll harvest those this fall. And we will, if we, if we got good survival, they will go back in over there next spring and we'll grow them out to full size and see if we can improve the harvest or the fallow time. So I didn't mention that. So when, so um, the clam fishery is a lot like the lobster fishery in that you have these regional councils and they have a lot to say about the local rules about how the fishing is done. And so you can say, well, we're going to harvest here this year, but next year it's going to be fallow and the harvesting is going to be over here and here. And so they usually let it fallow for a couple of years before they go back. And so one of the things that we're trying to do in addition to just make sure that we can always have some, bit, some um, adult clams to harvest is to um, reduce the fallowing time. So if you could seed a flat, maybe you could harvest it every other year instead of every third year. So that would have a huge economic impact for these towns. So oh, I kind of forget the economics, but each of these mud flats is worth millions of dollars to the local community. So, um, so I forget what the, I, I, I can't remember the figures, but um, for the Union River, for instance, the, um, the Aylwy fishery, even though there's two dams on the Union River, um, Ellsworth alone makes um, $100,000 a year off of that. So they're allowed to get 40%. So that means that the, the fishermen are getting 60%. So that's, that's a quarter of a million dollar fishery right there. And that's just the cash on the barrel end of the fishery. So the alewives are also used as bait for the lobster fishery. So there's downstream economic impacts as well. And then there's the elver fishery. And I did some back of the envelope numbers on that and estimated that that might be two or three million dollars on the Union. Well, it's a big river, but still, that's a lot of money in a local economy. And these mud flats probably have that kind of value. Yeah. In Taunton Bay, so that's two towns, three towns, two towns, two towns, I guess. So that's, that's good money. That's a real, real jolt to the local economy. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, sure. You mentioned that there are areas of, 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 of clam flats that, that go dead. And, um, and uh, I wondered whether anyone has actually correlated that with the pH change and with... We tried to. Acid rain. And um, we couldn't find any correlation. And Brian Beal, who's done more of this than we have, and Casco Bay, who's done more of this, all three of us agree that the mud flats that are dead are dead for no apparent reason. We've never really been able to figure it out. Um, 
We think it has more to do with the natural factors, the production of spat and the where, where, where the spat goes. So, so these, these are broadcast spawners. They spawn, it goes up into the plankton. The plankton goes in and out of the bays. And um, uh, there's been some recent modeling of the tidal exchanges in these bays. And a lot of the water that goes out comes back but also a lot of the water that goes out of Taunton Bay goes into the skillings when that tide comes back in. So there's a certain amount of exchange. So a certain amount of your clams, which are spawning and creating this cloud of zooplankton that's moving in and out with the tide, and then it settles out somewhere, maybe 50% of those will settle out here, but another 50%, 40%, whatever it is, is going to um, settle out in the next bay down the downstream. In um, um, the Skillings or maybe Frenchman's Bay. And so it's really kind of complicated, but we think it's, it has to do with where the, um, where the spawning is going on, um, how the zooplankton is getting distributed, uh, where things settle out, and survivorship where they settle out. We think those patterns are overwhelming, are much more important than pH per se. So pH per se isn't, it's not that it's not important, it's just that these other factors seem to be much more important. Does the spawning take place? In the spring. So we try to get our nets out, our spat boxes, out at the end of April or May, certainly by the 1st of June. So if you want any spat boxes, be sure to contact us early and uh, have all your arrangements lined up with your school in advance. So we take them out in the fall. It would be nice to take them out in November, but weather gets kind of nasty. And, and if you're in a boat going into the skillings and the waves and you're all wet because of the spray, this is something you want to do in October, not November. <clears throat> so we do it in October. telling us something about the, the red tide research that you're doing? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the red tide stuff is really interesting. Um, the red tides develop offshore, and um, there were always some, but they become much more common uh, the more white people there are and more concentrated populations there are and the more pollution we have. and. Um, so these, they seem to develop offshore and then the tides and winds bring them in. And um, <clears throat> they can come way in. And so they come into Frenchman's Bay and um, we have hazardous algal bloom alerts um, in almost all of our coastal waters. So Frenchman's Bay, um, Bagadoos are the ones that I'm most familiar with. Um, basically from Casco Bay to Perry, we have alerts every year. Um, it used to be mainly dinoflagellates. Um, Pseudonitsia diatom has always been here, but since 2016, it's become really important and um, dominant and scary because the dinoflagellates um, that we were looking at um, are known for the uh, diarrheic shellfish poisoning, which um, can be uncomfortable, but it usually isn't fatal. The, the pseudonitsia produces paralytic shellfish poisoning and, um, you know, people die. Yeah, it'll, it'll stop your heart. Stop, stop, stop breathing. It's a real 911 kind of event. 
I was saying that's new since 2016. So 2016 was a really hot summer. It was dry. Um, it was a really bad year for a number of reasons. It was bad for salmon, bad for lobster. The lobsters molted early and the market crashed because uh, the, the fishermen get the premium price for the, the hard shell, not the soft shell lobster. Um, and the, the issue has stayed with us. And um, not only that, but the blooms have been later and later into the season. So we think of these pseudonitia blooms as something that um, we saw, <coughs> that we, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that we saw a lot in Florida and south <coughs> and recently became a problem here. <coughs> it developed in the heat of the summer but then in 2016 and later, the problem has continued into December, much to everybody's surprise. So I used to be done red tide monitoring by October or something. All the excitement was over. Not anymore. So I usually begin in, say, June, May, June, certainly by June, and go to as long as I can. And how does one do that? Do you do it from the air? Uh, from yeah. Lobster men reporting? Uh, what, what sort of? So I need to get out into the water. And um, so I, I make friends with people who have nice long docks. And so I, I sample off the dock of the Bagadoose Lunch at the falls. And I have lunch there usually. <laughs> it's part of the politics of using their dock. Um, and they have great food, of course. And I use the town ramp at, um, in Brooklyn at Smith Cove. So as long as the ramps are there, I'm monitoring. If the ramps are taken out, I sometimes wait out as far as I can go. But um, it's best to get far out because you want to get the, the ocean water coming in. So remember, the tide goes out, the tide comes in, a lot of the water that that was in the bay comes back with the tide and it gets pushed up against the shore. And um, so the, the most marine of the waters, the one is the water that's um, closest to the ocean and closest to the middle of the channel. And so in the Bagadoose, I would, I would prefer to sample from the channel the Bagadoose Lunch dock doesn't go that far, but you know how the current is there. I get, I get really good data from there. So, um, you know, I've, I've always been able to see it. <laughs> oh, yes. Really. Yes, so we have a filter. Yeah, so you asked me. So I filter 10 liters of water. So I have a bucket, has a five liter line on it. Pour two buckets through a filter. My filter is a um, piece of whatever it is, I don't know, six inch PVC pipe. Maybe it's smaller, maybe it's four inches. We'll say four inch PVC pipe with a, uh, a Nitec screen on the bottom and it's glued in place. So there's a piece of pipe on the bottom sandwiched together squeezing this Nitec screen. It's like window screen, but really, really fine. It's 50, let's see, is it 50? I think it's 40 micrometers. That's 40 millionths of a meter. So it's, it's, it's for catching phytoplankton. So I, I understand that you would identify them that way, but catch them Under a microscope, yeah. Them. Presumably, if you're surveying uh, the bay or the whole main coast, you, you, you've got to have a lot of different points where you're yeah. observation. So DMR has their points. So they do Dice's Head at Castine. I'm doing inside the harbor, kind of, well, across from Castine. So I'm at uh, Smith's Cove. And then further up the Bagadoos at the Bagadoos Lunch. So that's three data points, and you can see how far the bad stuff is moving 
into the bay. Um, MDI Lab is doing Frenchman's Bay off of their dock, which is there in Eden. You know where the MDI Lab is. Yeah. And um, they used to do the town dock in Bar Harbor as well. I don't know if that's still being done. Then they would also go south down to Otter Cove or something. I don't know if there's a dock out there. They might use a private dock. Um, so they used to do three sites around MDI. Um, oh, so MDI, so Maine Department of Natural Resources has their sites, and then volunteers fill in in between. And so there's 30 of us, volunteers or something like that. There's, it's quite a network of citizen scientists doing this. And if you don't have a microscope, they'll let you borrow one. And if, you're, if this is something you would like to do, actually, um, I was asked one time if I could do uh, Gordon's Wharf. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. They would love to have that. Um, I'm usually going the other way. If the other way had been more boring, I might have been down here. <laughs> but I've been having alerts up that way. So I've, you would do it right off the dock. And so you'd, kind of, you'd go out at high tide. So I think you could do that at high tide. You could scoop from the dock, right, with a five-gallon bucket. Oh, yeah. But there's also a way to get down there. Oh, okay, if you had to. Yeah, you could walk right down. Yeah, okay. So we want to, you want to be out as close to the, to, the middle. to the middle, or at least the main current. And um, you need to be, you need to sample at the high tide. You would pour 10 liters through this filter. You backwash the filter into a little jar. You put some of that under a microscope. Keep track of your dilution factor. And then you report that to DMR. And if the bad guys are present, then DMR will go back and test for the poison. Not the, not the critter, but, but, the, but the poison. And so if the poison level in mussel meat or clam meat is at a certain level, they'll shut everything down. How often do you sample? I do once a week. I hope so. <laughs> At least somebody loves me. How prevalent is the Pseudonitsia? It's all up and down the coast. So when it's bad in Casco Bay, it's less bad here, and it's really bad, um, you know up at uh, Eastport and Perry. So the two ends of Maine tend to be the worst. And it's where things tend to start and then it kind of fills more into the middle. And, and uh, so the, the, the water that we can see that is uh, discolored, red, uh, is, yeah. is, is, is... It won't be red. the worst. Yeah. But, is water that is that appears to be clear to the naked eye um, potentially contaminated also then? Potentially. So the thing is, is that um, the clams are concentrating it. So their filter feeders, they don't have much of a central nervous system, so they don't really care. But they, they tolerate this poison and they really concentrate it. And then when you get it, you can get a fatal dose. And so um, just because the water is clear doesn't mean that it's safe. And you know, the clam might have been poisoned from two or three days ago. So just because it's clear today doesn't mean it's safe. And, um, and the clams are concentrating it. And so usually when conditions are bad, the water looks green or brown to me. We don't have red tides per se here. So the term red tide comes from the southern states where they have different critters that have um, hematochromes. So they're, they're hmm. it's, a, it's a pigment like hemoglobin, 
it's not used for oxygen, but it's used as a um, it's used as a pigment to protect the organism from ultraviolet light. And it's a it's it's a red pigment similar to hemoglobin. And it's only found in certain critters, uh, some dinoflagellates. Um, some other kinds of flagellates. Um, sometimes you see snow that's turned red. That's a little flagellate with a hematochrome. Perfectly harmless, but uh, with that red pigment. So anyway, yeah, our bad guys tend to be brown, kind of off green color, olive green, or sometimes brown. I've seen it in Castine Harbor, just really brown and kind of stink. I'm asthmatic and it just set my asthma off like that. I was out of my boat. I didn't have my inhaler. I was really uncomfortable. Wow. Yeah. Huh. It can be dangerous, really dangerous. Wow. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank you. Nice, nice to meet you all. Thank you for coming. <laughs>